Welcome to the Last Tackle podcast here on loverugbyleague.com, the ultimate home for everything rugby league. I'm James Gordon, joined by Drew Derbyshire and Keith Mason has made the trip over the Pennines to be with us today. Thanks Keith for uh, coming in, you brought some some shirts to uh, lighten things up. We, we, we'll start with that if you want, Let, tell us a bit about Rugby Blood and I'm sure people have seen it already but it's a big little project for you at the moment. Yeah, first and foremost it's, uh, it's great to be here, it's always an honour to come back and speak uh, about rugby league. The game that uh, pretty much gave me everything and, and obviously led to uh, creating rugby blood. Obviously with the shirts, uh, we've gone one step further regarding the, the graphic novel, uh, Rugby Blood, which I brought out, I think it was last July, uh, uh, the Super League, Bedford Super League endorsed it. And obviously it was a film script which I'd co-written, uh, first of all, and then obviously knowing the entertainment business, uh, it takes a long time to, to get a film made. You need investors, producers, directors, stars. Uh, so obviously I came up with the idea for, for creating the first ever rugby league comic about a rugby star, including some of the world's biggest stars uh, as characters. Uh, and obviously O'Neill's contacted me. I went to St. Helens uh, to pick up my heritage number a number of months ago. And uh, Neil Williams, who was the director at O'Neill's, uh, was sat in the, the audience. He contacted me and he just said, look, if we really like the, uh, the idea of rugby blood and we'd love to uh, create some bespoke playing kits with all meals. So we got a meeting with them, sat down with them. I uh, loved the idea, loved the concept of what they wanted to, to achieve regarding uh, playing jerseys for, for rugby blood. And uh, so here we are. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we came up with the, we came up with the idea with, with the ghost images, David King eyes, uh, three different kits. You've got the No Sacrifice, No Glory. Kit. You've got the original uh, David King Ruby Book kit and the special edition Magic Weekend kit. Uh, and we did the launch uh, video just uh, about two weeks ago now uh, with some of the Ruby Book boys, right. obviously Super League players. Uh, we got Zach Hardy come in, Zach Hardy came over, uh, Jermaine McGillery, Liam Watson, myself. And we did the film with, uh, uh, did a, 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 a video with uh, Luke Balmasius looking at doing the sport documentary with myself and uh, Moz, Moz D for the Rugby Blood sports right. documentary which one we want to do on either Netflix or Amazon. Uh, so we're in the process of making that right now. Uh, but the, the, the kits hopefully will launch this week. Uh, the video looks fantastic. It's a mix of the comic and the players. Right. It's a bit of like a motivational video and you've got Zach Hardick saying, my name's Zach Hardick, a rubber's in my blood, rugby blood. You know, and it's just sort of totally different. Uh, it has grown, you know, in the space of eight months, you know, Rubber Blood has gone from being a graphic novel to, to now all meals and, you know, creating the kits and us uh, doing the, the TV series. What, what's the inspiration behind it? Is it, obviously you had a bit of experience with film and, and TV and stuff, and is it a way of you, I know Super League are quite big on this at the moment, aren't they, of using sort of that film and TV side to maybe raise awareness of Rugby mm-hmm. League, was that something that, that you had in mind when you first did it, or? Yeah, just, you know, since I did the film with Mickey Rock back in 2013, you know, I got a phone call, and uh, it's not every day you get a phone call off a film star saying they're going to join me in a film. And I would play the cast at the time, and I just said, uh, really? He's like, yeah. And I says, right, <laughs> where do I need to be? What day do I have to be there? What part am I playing? And uh, so I got the sign sent through by the director. The director sent me... Uh, my, my role, which was Mr. Steiner. Now I'm going into this film, and you know, obviously I've never acted in my life. Uh, you've got people like Eric Roberts, who's in Batman, and uh, Daryl Anna, uh, Michael Madsen from Reservoir Res- Res- Dogs, you know, star after star after star. And I would doing all my scenes with Mickey Rock, and I played Mickey's henchman. And I had 13 lines. So being a rugby league player, uh, obviously you all know about it. It's well publicised, me being friends with Mickey. And, going out to the glitz of Hollywood and, and staying over there and seeing that life and then going flying up flying me over to New York and uh, every time we came to London you know we'd catch up and stuff and I just knew when I did that film I just knew I didn't I didn't want to do anything else. Uh, I played fourteen years at the top level. I'd gone through a well publicised court case which had won. Uh, but it took a lot out of me. It took a lot out of me and I kind of at that point I lost love for the for the game of rugby. 
you finished early, didn't you? You were 31, yeah. I think, when you finished. Could you? Was that was that a decision you made because of the film stuff? Could you have played on? I think the, the conscious division for me, I give rugby league everything I've got, you know, and I, I had a good career and, uh, you know, played on both sides of the continent, played for the NRL, played for my country, I won cup finals and I played with some of the greatest players in the world, you know. I'm the type of guy that when I feel like I can't give 100%, I have to leave it. And uh, I think the conscious decision I made was when I did the film, I thought, it was a bit of a boost for me because I went through a court case and I went to Castleford and I had to juggle me a few things. I lost my license, wasn't seeing my kids. There was a lot of things going on and it was very stressful. And for rugby league players, you know, the game itself is, is a stressful yeah. game. You're playing with injuries. When you've got a court case over the top of your head, you've got bills here, you've got your in debt, you've been, you're going through a court case and you don't know whether you're going to win or not. Uh, I lost my license. So there were a lot of things going on there. And when I did the film and I won my court case, I made it conscientious decision that I was going to retire and I was going to throw everything into my film career. Uh, not knowing that when you do retire, you know, you, you, you're stopping something you've, you've done yeah. since you were six years old. And I remember a good friend of mine, Joe Carl Zaggy, said to me, when you retire, you're a long time retired. Yeah. Now you have to fill in them gaps. When you're structured all the time and you have to be somewhere and you you're playing for that weekend and you're playing, you get that high. Uh, a lot of sportsmen, not just rugby league players, but most, but probably 95% 95, 95 of sportsmen struggle with depression, they struggle with finding that uh, similar high. So a lot of people turn to drugs and alcohol and, and et cetera, et cetera. With me, it's like I left the rugby league behind. I wasn't quite finished with rugby league. I still probably could have been playing now, you know, with the way I looked after myself. I've seen Jamie Thackeray this week, he was, he, I've seen him yesterday playing his yeah. court, you know. It's a No, honestly, <laughs> I, I, I would, uh, I, I, to be honest with you, you know, rugby, rugby league is a, is a tough sport, it's a young match game. And uh, to get an opportunity to be in a movie, to, to start alongside film stars, uh, it doesn't happen. So, so from retiring at 31, yeah. Did, would you say you fell out of love with the game then, at that point, in, at that moment in time? Yeah, I, yeah, I think I did. I think at that moment in time, I fell out, I fell out of love with the game. Uh, as in, I, my old club trapped me, and now I had to fight and, and, and clear mm. my name. So when I cleared my name, I, you know, I, I could retire. I was comfortable, but obviously, you know, money runs out and lasts forever. Mm. Uh, and I did the film, and. It was probably about two years, I was just like in a haze, in a, in a fog. Uh, the one thing I did was, well, I stayed in the gym, and I, and, I, and I was in the gym pretty much every single day, but I wasn't living really healthy, I wasn't uh, very clean, and I wasn't very focused on what I wanted. Uh, and it was, it was a difficult transition. Until I met my partner, who was, was paralysed, uh, she reached out to me, uh, said she wanted a trainer. She rocked up to the gym one day, Come out of the car, and I could see she has uh, walking sticks. You know, she was she was something wrong with her legs, and uh, I think meeting Riona uh, changed my whole perspective of, of life. If a woman can get up and take care of seven kids and a family of nine and be paralysed and can't feel her legs, then what's my excuse? And I stopped drinking about two and a half years ago, and in the space of two and a half years ago, you know, I've, I've done. Cold Feet, Bulletproof, uh, Killers and Ominous. I've done a number of, a number of films. And uh, since I got focused and real dedicated again, like I was when I was, a, when I was playing rugby league, uh, things have started happening. And obviously, rugby Blood, that's what rugby Blood came about. Uh, I went to Super League and pitched the idea to Robert Elston and said, look, this is there's nothing like it. I want to showcase these players as, as comic book heroes, as, as stars, uh, and get it to places where rugby league's never been. Graphic novels being sold in China and Russia and stuff, and rugby people in rugby in China probably don't know what rugby league is. And if you look at the population of China, there's a billion people. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Is it is is David King based on anyone in particular? Looks is a it, bit looks a bit like you. My decision. I mean, obviously, is it, is it so you can play the lead character in the film? Is that well, that's <laughs> correct? Yeah. That's, yeah. 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 that's definitely true. Yeah. <laughs> Who better can play? Right? <laughs> Who better can play a rugby player in a movie than someone's played a rugby? Player? Uh, the idea was uh, I reached out to Paul Roper, who was the who was the artist, and uh, 
I said, listen, I have a story for you, Paul. I mean, he reached out to me first and foremost, and he said to me, Keith, I really admire what you're doing from life after sport, because you can look at a lot of rugby league players, you get forgotten about, or they become depressed, or they go to jail, or they end up killing themselves. Yeah. And uh, you, you know about, there's a, there's a few people we, we can mention, uh, God bless their souls, and uh, that would never going to be my path. You know, for me, when one chapter's done, you have to push on and, and set yourself new goals, and I think, my advice to any sportsman is that when you retire from a high, 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 high end sport, you have to rededicate yourself. There's only a few, few people who can use the, the mind to be really smart and go into property or go into it. But a lot of rugby league players haven't the time to do that. They're just so focused on rugby league, and that's their world. Now, when I retired, you know, I ended up being bankrupt, lost, losing two houses, uh, pretty much becoming homeless, and then ended up back in the place where I grew up in my mum's house in a small box bedroom and I knew then I had to start all over again and a lot of that was because I was I wasn't I was lost I couldn't turn to anybody you know and a lot of rugby players are big strong guys and they tend to not open up because they're scared of, of what the, the response will get or if they don't trust that person or you know th th there's a lot of a lot of factors why men don't open up uh, but for me, it's very courageous. If you can open up about your problems and uh, better yourself and, and look at what the problem is, uh, and I always say, you know, take it one good day at a time. And, it, and, it, and I basically built myself back up, yeah. set myself some goals out. Obviously, I've done the film. In the process of that, you know, I, I learned to screenwrite, uh, write comic books, uh, you know, start my own CBD company, Project Mason. Uh, now, producing films, which I'm just filming right now, which is imperative. It's a crime thriller. Uh, crime thriller. I play a guy called DCI Sullivan. He's a hunting down a uh, serial killer. Uh -huh. He's a very dysfunctional guy. He's, he drinks a lot, takes drugs, but because of he lost his wife and he lost his daughter, they got murdered. And he's a functional detective, but he, he's not living a very healthy life. And, and, and he, you know, people can relate to that because you know, you're going to work and stuff, but you've, you're depressed, mm -hmm. you don't feel good. So you have to numb that with, with narcotics or drink or alcohol or whatever. Uh, and this is the first film I've, I've produced and it's going to be too bit exciting. It's, it's, a, it's a bit like Luther, right. uh, but like a northern version. You are, you gonna, are you going to start recruiting some more rugby league players to turn up? Is there, you yeah. must have come across Rob Parker somewhere. Rob Parker did that, didn't he? He's been in a few, Has he? Um, a few little TVs and film. I've heard he's done. Uh, so, I, I he did some with Tom Hardy, I think. Yeah, I, I know he did like an extra role in yeah, yeah. yeah, I spoke to him uh, quite a while ago when I when I collected my uh, lifetime achievement award uh, at Super at uh, the grand final. I think it was two thousand and fourteen or fifteen. Uh, I did actually. I was in I was in a, a Netflix series called uh, Jack Stall Dead, and I casted uh, Conrad Hurrell and McGilvery. All right. But because of their Diary, and yeah, the play, and they stuff. couldn't come. But like I said, I were giving back, you know, we're giving back to them guys, giving them opportunities, uh, which they loved. But obviously, with the diary and the rugby league season, it's very tough to just jump out and go, Listen, coach, I'm off to being a mother today. <laughs> but you just can't do it, you know. <laughs> well, with the, uh, when you're a, you're a full time rugby league player, it's and we, we see some past players now say it's always good to have a plan B option. Your case was it. It's very rare, isn't it, to, to go into acting after uh, uh, being a professional rugby league player. It's hard though, isn't it, to say you've got to have a plan B when you finish because like you say, yeah. players are so focused on just getting the win at the weekend yeah. and training throughout the week. Yeah. It's hard to have that plan B for, for a player and this is why players struggle mm. as soon as they retire. Yeah, and, and, and to be honest with you, you know, with my story and what I've done and what I've achieved, coming from, starting from scratch again, losing everything to be where I am right now uh, can only inspire people not just rugby league people but sports people that when rugby league or any sport when you've, when you've finished you've got to imagine you've got 70 years left to live on this planet yeah. mm. it's not over is it? Yeah, yeah. but this is how we sportsmen feel mm. we have an identity crisis what am I going to do now? Well, what you need to do is you need to keep doing what makes you good and that's being in the gym yeah, and, that, and you said about Rihanna before, that, was that focus, do you think that sort of, the being able to focus on helping her almost replaced that dedication that you had to have yeah. for playing? Yeah, you could pretty much say that, yeah. And not only that, seeing a woman be 
yeah, she, she's inspiring. But getting up and, and not feeling in her legs and looking after her family and supporting me, it was one that I supported her. She, yeah, she became like my, uh, she was like my challenge, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, to help her walk in. And as you guys know, she had a second stroke a year and a half ago on New Year's Eve. And all the work we'd done, uh, she lost, you know. But I found out a lot about myself as well, you know, as a, as a person, as a human being. And she definitely brought the best out of me. She just wanted the best for me. Uh, and what I did is I kind of, I cut off all the, the negative baggage out of my life. When I retired, I had a lot of people around me who wasn't good for me. And people around me now are people like the filmmakers, the good friends, uh, the people who are part of Rugby Blood. They're the people who are great people who are ambitious who want to get better. Uh, and I think we, you know, you are a victim to your environment. And I always say that, you know, you show me a crowd and I'll show you future. Mm. And I like to be around people who are go getters. Yeah. And then my favourite type of people are people who have lost it, completely messed up, and bounce back and shine. Are we going to see, is Dave King going to have a love interest in any of the novels, or has he got a love oh, interest? Oh, he's not family, yeah. got someone in there yeah, already? My, my missus is not happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it, because who would you cast as the woman in the film if you were the main part? <laughs> That'd be a touchy yeah. subject, will it? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, in the uh, in the actual film, his, his, his family gets kidnapped, you know, and you've got to look at the the fictional element of rugby blood. You know, we can't just be talking about rugby league or we'll lead tackles him and he scores mm. a try. That's yeah. just part of it, right? Yeah. But really, it's a story about it's a story about a young kid. The first book is in origins to uh, David King. So if you watch the film, David King's gonna be he's gonna be a when he's grown up. But how how does he become David King? So in the original comic, the first one, it shows you David King as a young boy who's in a lot of trouble, who's misguided, has no father figure, uh, loses his mom of cancer, and. He's very talented at rugby, but he's very lost at the same time. And uh, he needs to guide his, his aggression into sport. And that's where Johnny Bronson comes in as a mentor. And he says to David King, you know, you have to have sacrifice, no sacrifice, no glory. And the kid has to overcome obstacles and a lot of adversity to become the player he is. Now, a lot of sportsmen can relate to that, especially rugby league players. And what I did is I kind of made it a kind of like an autobiographical graphic novel. We decided with, with Paul Roper that we would make that kid me. No. Because me as a kid, I was in a lot of trouble. You know, I was in a lot of trouble with the law. I, I wrapped up 44, 45 court, court appearances before I even turned 15. And when I came out of court that day and my friend went to jail, who, who I did most the misdemeanors with, I saw a lot that no kid should see. And I think. To be honest with you, that's learned me a lot about life. About, about, about life. Uh, I've learned more on the streets than I ever did in the inner school because I didn't finish it any of my schools. I kept on getting kicked out of all my schools. Not because I was a bad kid, but because I was probably daydreaming and wanting to be a rugby league player. So when I came out of court that day, uh, I was 14, I just had this kind of an epiphany that, right, this is it. This is your last chance. I want to be a rugby league player and I will do anything possible to, to, to make that happen. And I got my act together, and uh, that year I went to uh, play for Judge Moore, and uh, we won the under 16s competition. I played with a kid called Matt Diskin, who we played at uh, Leeds. And then I got picked for Yorkshire, and then Great Britain Schoolboys. In the 16s, we went out to, uh, to France, and uh, we beat them 56 6 at Leon Price, Dan McGuire playing for his brother. Wow. And then, yeah, and then I uh, had my few discs, and then when I came back, uh, everybody, everybody had been signed, apart from, apart from me and Wayne Price. So I had to go to Bradford, I had to trial at Bradford, uh, they said no. Then I trialled at Castleford, Graham Steadman said no. And then I trialled at Leeds, and I've, I've spoken about this before. Uh, and he just pulled me to one side and said, you know, you'll never play Super League. I don't think you're a Super League player. You know, lo and behold, three years later, I was on a plane to Australia. To yeah, yeah. For Melvin Stone. Was gonna, I was going to bring that up after. We, we can talk about that now. How did that come about, the, the whole Melbourne thing? Well, I got, I got selected. I was playing, uh, playing first team at 17 at Wakefield. And I played a full year at 18, uh, 18 years old. I was uh, from my forward for, for, for Wakefield. And I got picked to play for Wales. I got the phone call the day before. And even though I wasn't born in Wales, I am English. 
uh, I think it was on my, 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 dad, my dad's side, uh, my granddad, or someone down there anyway. So I wanted to make sure that I got a letter from Graham McCallan saying that if I played for Wales, it wouldn't jeopardise the England future because I did go and play for the Great Britain mm. 21s that mm. the following year and then England in 2003. Uh, so I got the letter and I just rocked up, didn't even train with the guys and I remember walking into the, into the, into the dressing shed and I seen Kieran, well it was, I didn't see Kieran, I heard Kieran being sick <laughs> in, in the cubicle. <laughs> now I had Kieran putting him on my wall, believe it or not, <laughs> so, as a young kid, you know, and uh, someone who I admired, who I later went on to play with, yeah, yeah. won the Challenge Cup final yeah. with Kieran, he was my fucking old partner, probably the best I could have played with, I played with Cameron Smith as well. Not uh, too bad of quiz though. <laughs> yeah, not bad, yeah. Uh, Done well, Cameron. Uh, so he walked out and he'd been sick in there and he looked he was jet white, you know, and he just looked like uh, he wasn't in a good place. I thought, well, I felt great. I felt like this is awesome. You know, 18 year old, <laughs> I was a starting front row player. They are uh, Radlinski, Andy Farrell, Skullfort, uh, McDermott, Sanderson's, uh, Paul Deacon, Terry Newland, uh, Paul Wellens. They had a really good team, right? And I was. I think with me, when I was a kid, I had no fear. I was fearless. I love playing against these big teams and big players. And I think that ultimately got me to Melbourne. So I played in that game, and I, and I think I got the man of the match in that game. Uh, and we were actually beating England 26-10 uh, at half time. It was at uh, Wrexham. And then they went on to beat us, I think, with 36-28. A pretty close game, you know, and we had probably three Super League players playing. Well, uh, we had me, Martin Pearson. Uh, and the soft culture player as well. Oh, Ian Watson. Watson. He was playing, yeah. I remember him being a very public guy. And, uh, Melbourne was watching that game, right. Chris Anderson and John Reid, and they were looking for an English forward, a young forward. And luckily, it was me. <laughs> so they came over, they offered me a deal, they paid uh, Wakefield $100,000 right. to get me there. And that was, that was, big, that was pretty big money at the time, then. Yeah. Uh, you know, I went over there, I moved in with Cameron. Smith and his wife now Barbara. Right. Uh, it was just amazing, you know. It would either go to Melbourne or sign for sign for Leeds because Leeds actually came in ironically came back oh, in. Have, said, and they, they offered me a four year <laughs> deal. But they offered me a four year deal. They offered me money what they were paying the, the internationals. Right. So they wanted me bad. Uh, but I just thought, you know what? Go to Melbourne now. I'll be only the second player to, to go there. Uh, at the time yeah, it was, it was yeah. Morley. And. Uh, it was amazing. I was, I was looking, you had it, yeah, Cameron Smith was 20, Billy Slater was 20, Billy Slater was top try scorer that season. They had Stephen Kearney as well. Scott Hill, uh, they had Robbie Ross, they had Rodney Howe, Robbie Kearns, Rich, yeah, Richard Swain, uh, Matt Ruer, uh, Matt Geyer. What was it like? like? How different was it for you being over there? For me, uh, knowing where I'd come from and how hard I'd had to work, being a kid, who said I went into jail, you know, being misled, being in the wrong company, uh, to go in, ready to go to jail at 15, and then four years later jumping in the plane to Qantas, on the, on the Qantas air, air flight, went to the yeah, NRL. Well, mm. You couldn't really write that. And you, and you played a handful of games, four or, four or five, I think. Yep. Was that, was, did you ever look back at that as a regret, or were you pleased just to get them four or five chances that you did get? Do you think you could have played more, or? I definitely could have played more, yeah, but there's no regrets there, mate. I was 19 years old. I was a baby. We had 24 internationals in that team. Uh, and if we didn't play in the first team, then we get flown up to Brisbane, Brisbane Norths, and our team for Brisbane Norths would be uh, Billy Slater, Semi Tajalala, Jake Webster in the three quarters. Uh, Greg Inglis, and then you'd have Cooper Cronk in the arse, Mike yeah. Turner. The front rows were me and Mitchell Sargent, Cameron Smith, and the back row as well was Dallas Johnson, Brian Hoffman. And, uh, what Mick, a team. Mick, so, so, <laughs> that team would have won the Super League that year. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? No, it's no regrets, man. Yeah. Jesus Christ, I'm the youngest ever English player to go and play there. I was 19. Do you feel forgotten about sometimes? Because your name doesn't come up in dispatches very often when people talk about players that went to the NRL, and I know you only played. A handful of games, but at the, at the same time, a massive achievement for yourself. Yeah, especially to do it so young because we normally see Super League players going over in mid mid twenties. They'll they'll try and conquer Super League, sh shall we say, for four or five years, and then they'll make the move over. You made it near f after one full season in yeah. in Super League. Yeah, I just uh, no. I think it was 
I loved every minute of it. I'm still friends with all them boys over there. Uh, I give it my best shot. Uh, I was super fit. The second year I was there, I acclimatised to the game, and uh, my pre-season was phenomenal. Uh, and the only reason why I came back because there were there were a, a scout, so a, a manager uh, spouting my name off to clubs over in England, why knew nothing about. So the reason why I came back is because the club then then came in with St Helens and, and Bradford and, 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 and all the top five, six clubs came in with offers, big offers, and that's the reason why I came back. And Saints was the only team I'd ever come back to because Saints were always interested in me as a kid. And with the players, uh, with the cal calibre of the players they had there with Paul Schofield yeah. and, and Cunningham and uh, Darren Britton, Long, uh, Charlotte, Long, Long all players in the prime. Yeah. And to come back and, and, and win a league leaders and a challenge cup in the space of a season. And then having my son, yeah. you know, so there's, there's no regrets in me whatsoever. Throughout my career, I give it my best. And uh, everything I've done since that kid who, who got arrested 50 times is a bonus, mate. So yeah. you should never look at something and go, oh, well, I regret that. Well, I can't regret it because I always say, you give it your best shot. And it should never be for a lack of effort that you don't succeed. Yeah. So people want to be, you know, you want to be a sportsman, you want to be an electrician, you want to be good at something. It should never be for a lack of effort. So I think you shouldn't be able to look at, you shouldn't be able to look or have that mindset of, well, do you regret it? Well, no, I don't, because everything I've done is just building blocks to where I am right now. Mm. And like I say, you came back to St. Helens and, and obviously tasted that bit of success there, which, which have you still got your medal and, and all that? Is that something you cherish or? Have I still got my medal? It's a challenge got winner's medal. Of course I've got my medal. <laughs> we don't know, some, some players, I speak to some players and they just like throw it in a drawer and, and forget about it. Well, at the end of the day, it's a physical thing, isn't it? But what you can't take away is that we made history. We we're going to be in the history books from 200 years from now. Mm. And the way we won that Challenge Cup, we played every top team to get to that final. We played Bradford in the first round, beat Bradford. Then we played Leeds, beat Leeds. Then we played Hull, beat Hull. Then we played an inform uh, Huddersfield team. We got 40 past them. And then we played Wigan in the final. You're not going to get mm -hmm. a run of a Challenge Cup where you're going to play the top five teams. Mm. And we played Wigan, and to be honest with you, you know, them, them two teams was world class. If you've seen, you've seen a, a lot of Challenge Cup finals over the last, last 10 years, a lot of teams have been outmatched, mm. you know what I mean? And I think with them teams, you know, they had... They were almost like two teams at the peak. At the peak, yeah, yeah you had Farrell, you had yeah. O'Connor, you had uh, Brad Dallas, yeah. uh, I think Adrian Lamb played. Uh, you know, he had some really good players, uh, Radlinski played. And then we had our team, and, and mm -hmm. to be honest with you, I think we would have gone on and won the, the Super League if Longy and Gleeson yeah. had put, <laughs> put, their misdemeanour. Put a bet on. Uh, <laughs> so, what yeah. was it like that? Where, like, what did the other lads think about that situation when it happened? Was it a bit frosty in training or anything like that? What was the, the, the overall after? Well, to be honest with you, you know what, saying this, man, it was so much fun. In my friend of playing days were at St. Helens. You know, we'd be in the gym just before kickoff and Scully would be doing 20 reps and 100 kilo bench press. It was so much fun because we had so much talent mm. and we knew we were going to go out there and win. Mm. And it was just so enjoyable, you know, to be there playing at the starting front row at 21 at St. Helens. At that time, it was such an awesome time to play at St. Helens. It was very special, mm. you know, to play in, to play in a, to get to our final, 88,000 people, I only were there, but on that day, it was a red hot day and, and just the, the whole week and then lifting that trophy to to know where I've been and, and what I've achieved since that young kid who was ready to go to jail yeah. to pick a trophy and make history you can never take that away and to, and to share that victory with, with, with such, such a special group of players uh, it definitely has you know it, it didn't make me the man I am it's part yeah. of who I am it's part of my makeup and uh, you know I look, I look back and I always if you have a lot of players, Scully, Longy, that was their favourite game they ever played in. Right. Mm. So obviously makes that, what happened afterwards, a bit bit more disappointing that you couldn't have gone on and got that grand final, perhaps. Yeah, well, listen, if, if you're talking about regrets and stuff like that, I think if you if you, if you you talk to Scully, uh, not Scully, uh, Longy and, and Gleeson, asking about it. regrets, you don't, <laughs> you don't regret going to Australia, you, don't. you would regret doing something like that yeah. and going in and put, mm. putting a bet on. Uh, that's life, man. Listen, everybody makes mistakes. We all make mistakes. Um, and where, so how, how closely do you follow it these days, the Super League? Are you, are you a big, do you watch a lot of games or is it just something that's there in the background these days? Well, obviously, 
I watch my old team. I, I, I'm always a supporter of Saints. Uh, I'm always welcome back with open arms over at St. Helens. Uh, and I've got a lot of mates. A lot of mates still playing. You know, I've got all the rugby club boys in there. Uh, even all the NRL boys like you know, Caelan Ponga, Adukar, Pernas, Jack Whiting, uh, Nick Crottage, uh, Luke Keery, Victor Adley. All these boys are part of rugby club, you know. And to come back in the game like this and bring that different element back into the game and, and it's only growing you know I saw it as a franchise and that's exactly what it is uh, we want to do the TV series the film uh, now we're doing the you know the clothing yeah, range yeah. and stuff uh, with all meals uh, and, I've, and I've created something that will last forever yeah. you know rock is it's still slides as long as it's rocking I've got my rugby blood and rugby blood the message behind it is all about never giving up and having true grip that's the message behind rugby blood you know, you can you can read. It's about a kid who overcomes stuff, and uh, he doesn't have special powers, but he never gives in on the task. And I think that's important for even for mental health and, and what, people reading in now. What do you miss most about playing? What do I miss most? You, you obviously enjoy yourself, Paul's career now. But yeah. If there's one thing that you could uh, you could go back to in your playing days, what would it be? There's so many. There's so many good memories I've, I've got. Uh, and, and to be fair, to win stuff, you know, some, there's some great players that never go on and win, mm -hmm. and I can cherish them victories, mm -hmm. you know, close to my heart, you know, with, with the Challenge Cup finals, three I've played in, but to win one, and then yeah. obviously win a league leaders, play for my country, go to Australia, it's just, it's just amazing. You might say in 200 years time, they can have your Challenge Cup medal next to your rugby yeah, so, book, it'll be well, there, won't it, to, and there you go. To be honest with you, you know, I think, yeah, it's been really nice, you know, what I've achieved in rugby, but right now, I feel as hungrier than I've ever done in my life because yeah. I had to start from scratch and everything I've created up to now it's like when you work so hard for something and it, and it starts happening you cherish it mm -hmm. you know it's like because people don't realize that I was in my mum's bedroom a little box bedroom was forgotten about yeah. four years ago to, to be now to be starring in films uh, to be creating the second uh, graphic novel that comes out and, and, and doing the uh, pilot we're doing we're putting the pilot together, uh, which includes my son, who's a tremendous player. He did a, he played all his rugby in St. Helens. He was born in St. Helens. Uh, he was captain of Royal St. James. Uh, he won the Northwest uh, Under 13s Northwest Player of the Year. Uh, he's a back rower. So what's he about 17, 18 now? Like no, 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 no. He's a, he's a, a bit too young. He's 14. Right, right. He's 14 and. Uh, He's playing with Siddle now, he's, right. so he's living over in, in Halifax with me, but uh, he's a tremendous player. Uh, Wigan have offered him a deal, uh, pretty much most of the sub clubs have, but Wigan, uh, Jack Rode and, and uh, John Jackson, Jack Jack has been there for 30 odd years, they absolutely love him. So I think he will probably end up signing the So he'll be like a proud dad in the stands then eventually. Yeah, Wigan, David yeah. King might have a son, <laughs> that extends, that gives you another series. Well of yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, what I'll do, I'll send you the videos over, I've got... <laughs> We actually did a scene from the actual graphic novel, uh, but it, it's including my son. So my right. son's playing the younger version of me because right, right. he's he is uh, chip off the old block. He spit dabs at me. <laughs> <laughs> he's a bit faster though. And <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll just talk about last weekend's game. David King might want to go off to Toronto at some point. A bit of a story idea for you there, Keith. <laughs> Toronto had a, had a tough time. It lost 66-12 at Leeds on Thursday night. Um, there's a lot of fuss about Toronto. Still a bit of fuss. I did a feature on the site last week, if you've seen it, that they're the first team to lose, the first promoted team to lose six out of six since Crusaders in 2009. But you still sort of feel like they'll win more games at home than Hull KR or Salford or something like that will manage in the season. Yeah, I think a lot of people are automatically assuming that Toronto will suffer relegation just because they've lost the first six games. But I don't know. They played the top five in Leeds, haven't they? Whoever I speak to, I said, just wait until they're in Canada. I think they'll win enough games when they're over there because it's important to remember that teams will be going over there, trying to make the, the trip in three or four days. Uh, it'll be very tough uh, on the players involved who are travelling over there. Uh, so I do think the Wolfpack will surprise quite a few people uh, when playing in and Canada yeah. and let's let's not forget that they have had an extremely tough start tough, to yeah. the season they've played Leeds Wigan they played last season Warrington. top five plus plus Leeds yeah so. and, and to be fair they've come on leaps and bounds since that, that first 
game at Castle, Castle. Uh, well against Castle the, the, for the league. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they've had a few close games. Obviously, that was a bit of a riot last week against Leeds. Two of your former clubs, Keith, uh, St. Helens and Huddersfield. Huddersfield won 12-10. They've won four out of four away from home so far this season, which is a decent start for the Giants. Yeah, it's a great start for Huddersfield, uh, you know, bearing the, 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 the form from last year. But like I say, you know, people get really excited about a club doing really well and having four wins, but, you know, it is a marathon and not a sprint. Uh, let's see where they are in the next four months. Uh, True champion speak, <laughs> uh, he knows. Uh, well, because we, we were getting excited about Drew from Wigan, I don't know if you've noticed. Um, and he, he's getting a bit excited because Wigan top of the league, 30 16, they beat Hulk out at the weekend. Bevan, Bevan, we were talking about this, Bevan French, there's. They're going to do well to keep him beyond this season, we think, Bevan French. He's a, he's a special talent, isn't he? I think it was Sean Kennedy who was, he was sent to the stands for an hot dog with, with an, <laughs> an outrageous dummy. It was a solid performance from Wigan. Uh, Hulk are dug, dug deep, they're doing it tough with injuries, and they've now got 12 first team players uh, on the sidelines, so they're doing it extremely tough, not only a couple of weeks into the season. Uh, I hope, for their sake, and Tony Smith's sake, that you can get a few more bodies back because 12, 12 plays, it's near. We see a lot of injuries now. Do you, do you think there's a lot more injuries now, Keith, than there was maybe when you were a, when you were a kid playing, coming through? You know, when you were, what was it like when you were 21 maybe? Mm. What, there just seems to be like there's a lot more injuries now. Well, listen, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the toughest game in the world. In, in, in the world. Uh, you're going to get injuries. You've got to think about it. Them players are going out there, no pads. Full frosted, mm -hmm. car crashes, every contact's like a car crash. Man. You know, people say, Do you miss it? <laughs> I do miss uh, elements, <laughs> but you know, to be work, to be in the state I am right now and be fit and healthy and be able to go to the gym and, and, and do what I want to do and not, well, I have got a bad back right now, yeah, yeah. but that might be because of years of. Uh, well, I mean, and there are yeah. some, there are plenty of players who struggle in their everyday life now because of the yes. injuries that suffer. I think Jamie Peacock uh, suffers quite a bit um, from. His playing days, I think he, he's had quite a few operations. I think Barry McDermott's had quite well, a few Did you a play with Was he not at Wakefield when you were at Wakefield? He had not. No, I was at uh, Wakefield. No, he's in a, you know, yeah, obviously he does a bit of work with State Mine, and that's how I know him. And you know, you, you look at him as a as someone who's left everything on the field and it really affects mm. his, his physical health. His, it, it, you know, really affects him on a day to day basis. And you sort of worry about the players these days, they're breaking down when they're at the peaks of the power. Sort of playing the game, what's it going to be like after? Um, but yeah, so Hulk are a tough one for them. Salford as well have, a, have had a tough start to the season. They lost 30 14 at Catalan. Uh, we had the first golden point of the season, I think. I think so. We should have checked this before we came on. Hull beat Wakefield 27 26. Um, Warrington beat Casford 9 8, which maybe gives a bit of breathing space for uh, for Warrington because they were getting a bit of, bit of stick recently. Uh, in Championship, Jews, Jews be lad, aren't you, Keith? Jews, yeah, we've right. had a really good start to the season. They've won three out of four. Right. They're doing all right. There was also wins for Featherston, Lee, Witness, London, and Bradford um, in the championship at the weekend. Lee and Toulouse, I think. Uh, did Toulouse not play? Toulouse. Toulouse did. Oh, Toulouse played. There was a win for Toulouse as well. So Lee and Toulouse are the are the top dogs in championship at the moment. Um, Challenge Cup this week. Jews will be playing on Wednesday night at Whitehaven, which is a a rearranged game that was postponed in the previous round. The winner of that will then play Newcastle at the weekend. The other games in the Challenge Cup, Super League teams come in, or four Super League teams come in this week. Huddersfield Toronto is on Wednesday night as well. Then we've got Featherston Hunslet, Wakefield Bradford, Sheffield Workton, Hull KR Lee, Witness Swinton, and York Rochdale. You're fancying a Lee upset, aren't you, at Hull KR? Yeah, I like the way Lee are going this season. Uh, unbeaten in the Championship, they had last, uh, last week's game called off at Swinton. Uh, but they're going really well. Hulky are struggling, and I, don't, I think if Hulky are went out to the cup, they would, they, they'd say they were disappointed. But I think it would be a blessing in disguise at this moment in time, just because of the injuries. Yeah, and it, you know, like I say, if they get knocked out, they'll have a free week somewhere down the line, won't they? And so they can rest up, get a few that might help them a little bit. The the Thursday night Sky match is Hull Warrington this week, and then the Friday is that Sky Salford Wigan Friday night Sky. I think so. Um, Catalan Leeds on Saturday and then Castleford St Helens on Sunday. The NRL starts this week as well. Parramatta Canterbury is the first game on Thursday morning. That's live on Sky as well. Um, Keith, your tips for the season then? 
Who do you think that who's, who's going to win Super League this season? Why are you in? You're going to say Saint Helens, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if my boy goes to Wigan, I'll be Wigan. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be getting a good one, by the way. Uh, uh, I like Wigan. Yeah. I like Wigan. I like. Uh, I just like the way they play. They're very gritty. And uh, bringing Jackson Hastings in there, you're getting the best of Bevan friends now. Uh, you've got you know world class centre in uh, fullback uh, Zach, mm. who's come on leaps and bounds. You know, very very proud of how far he's come since since what happened. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, he's just a testimony that you can change a life around. And come but uh, I was just going to say, he's a good example of what you were talking about. As someone who's had quite a few blows, and, and you know, some of them self inflicted. Let's not let's not forget that. But yep. he dusts himself off yep. and gets him back to being a. Because like I say, it's hard to be a world-class player without all that baggage, isn't it? Yeah, obviously, sometimes it's, it's the people you hang around with, it's, it's your, your friends from your past, or you know, it's people who are on the same journey as you. We've got to understand this, he's a high, he's a high-end athlete who's playing at the top of his game, and then he'll have friends probably who go to work 9 to 5. They have different mm. morals and values and principles. To play at this game, you need to live and breathe it. Mm. Uh, and I think a lot of players get caught up in being around the, in the wrong environment. Because you think about it, with M62 corridor, we're a working class mm. game. We're not from posh areas. We're from council estates, mm. you know. And from council estates, you're getting a lot of single parents and a lot of kids getting into trouble, like I was. Mm. But it took everything I've got to get out of that situation, yeah. have the career I have, you know. Yeah, people I, also can go one or two ways. Yeah, but you know, I was always the same. I was always loyal. I was always loyal to my friends, mm. the people who I've travelled the world and you know, been in a lot of places for rugby league and. My friends were still living in the same spot, mm. you know. And sometimes you just need to just cut that off, yeah. You know, for you to grow up, to become better. And I, I always say, you know, your struggles develop your strengths, and, and stones make you stronger. Mm. And it certainly did for Zach, and that's why I included Zach uh, in Rubber Blood. Mm. You know, he was over the moon, Zach. And obviously, I'm launching my own CBD company yeah. in the next two weeks called Project Mason CBD. And Project Mason stands for health and fitness, and getting back and looking after yourself and your mental health. And I've endorsed uh, some of the uh, some of the big stars from Super League, uh, Conrad Earl, Zach Hardick, and Daryl Clark, uh, uh, Sean Canadell. So you know, I'm always in a way always giving back. Yeah, yeah. You know, and if we do the TV series, which we're we shooting the pilot in uh, two weeks' time, right. and it's a ten minute trailer where it just shows you the day in life of David King getting up for a game, getting his kit ready, getting his stuff ready, and then uh, he kind of gets a knock on the door and these Russians come flying in all balaclava up and kidnap, kidnap his wife and his children. Then he wakes up and he's kind of strapped to a chair, opens his eyes and you see all these guys around him. And David King, you know, he can, he can fight a bit, you know, he can do martial arts and stuff. And you'll find that in the story. So he breaks out and then he ends up taking them all down. And then uh, the, the, the guy who was the leader, now he's strapped up. Right. And he's got a bag over his head, and when he picks up, you've got David King wrapping his hands like this, and he's just eyeballing him. Where's my family? <laughs> and that's where it ends. So we have we have that to pitch to Netflix and Amazon. Right. And then obviously the part with my son, yeah. uh, where he's, he's basically in the beginning of Rubber Blood, right. where he's running through a graveyard. Uh, and then obviously we've got the we got we got the graphic novel. And I'm, I'm working with Luke Balmasi, who's who's done. He's done the John John, John Barnes documentary. He's done the Alex Ferguson documentary. He's just done the, he's doing the PDR one right now. Uh, Looks up. It's a sign. <laughs> uh, and Moz, Moz, Moz D was the director of Top Sport. Now Moz wants to produce rugby blood sports documentary. So it would be about my journey after after rugby, uh, following me around, doing the films, etc., etc. Uh, and then the other part would be me travelling the world, speaking to big stars. So Joe Calzag has agreed to come on. John Arson's agreed to come on. So what we're going to be talking about is talking about mental health. Right, right. Talking about to former stars and how they've made that transition from being a, a sports right. star mm -hmm. to what you're doing now. And that's my journey. You know, it's very hard to rededicate yourself and throw yourself into something, especially if this is, you know, yeah. it's a very hard industry to be in. Mm -hmm. But... I've learned to scream, I, I've been yeah, proactive, yeah. you know, and I've, I've learned new skills, and I'm doing it myself, I'm producing, like I said, I'm producing Imperative, which comes out in October, and that'll be going worldwide, it'll be, yeah. it'll be shown in Indonesia, 
Uh, and it's my first lead for a film, so obviously people can see that I can actually act. <laughs> <laughs> so people who want to get rugby blood out, do they get hold of it? You just go to Amazon. It's Amazon is there. Search for the blood sites, yeah. Uh, the, the shot clock will be coming out uh, in the next month or two. Right. Uh, that's based in New York. Right. Uh, we've got about 25. Are you just creating all these exotic locations so you get to go there on holiday? Kids, <laughs> <laughs> well, New York's a very nice city. I've been there a couple of times. But I just thought it'd be it's relevant to doing New York right now because of, yeah, of, 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 yeah. of Ricky, you know, Ricky Willoughby's a friend of mine who's the founder of it. And uh, why not put New York in there? You know, at the end of the day, I'm not I'm not here to do what they've done for the last hundred years and let's all just be down into yeah, the yeah. corridor. You know, what I said to Rob Elston is that I'm going to bring something brand new to the game. Uh, if we do go to Netflix and do the Netflix documentary, then obviously Super League would be involved. Mm. Uh, and they can just do some spin-offs off the back of that and advertise and marketing and all that. Absolutely, look, at the end of the day, you know, you, you can imagine how many people go to Super League and say, we've got an idea. Yeah, yeah. Can you endorse it? And Super League endorsed it. They believed in it. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to go through, I had to meet Roger Jones, I had to meet, uh, you know, all the, all the team at Super League. And they are monitoring the progress of, of, uh, of Rugby Blood. But, it's just my way of coming back into the game and, and kind of, you know, showcasing the game, showcasing these players as, as superstars, because mm. that's what they are, you know. And I know one thing is that, you know, Rob Elston, he, he don't want a salary cap. He wants, he wants the game to be, you know, no salary caps. He, he can yeah, give these players, he can give these players what they need. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. at the end of the day, you know, they're just, some, they're just on bank average salaries, really, aren't they? Well, they're on executive salaries. You know, it's not, yeah. it's not a bad way to live, your, live your life and play the, the game that you love. But to, to go through the hammer, to, to go through the injuries year after year, and to be paid, you know, not massive money. Mm. You know, if we're in the wrong spot. If we play football, we'd be happy. Yeah. We won't be jumping off. We won't be all depressed and stuff. You'd have that money to fall yeah, back on. Good. And a lot of that is about not having financial status when you retire. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just hope that my story just go on and, and, and inspire kids, especially children, because I do go around to the clubs now and speak about mm. my journey and speak about rugby and what it means. And mm. you know, only the other day we had, had kids sending me loads of pictures in of them wearing David King outfits for World Cup. Yeah, you know, nice. And it just shows you how far it's come. Uh, but you know, this, I'm really excited about the next couple of years regarding rugby blood. Uh, but if we do the sports documentary, it's going to put rugby league on the map where. Rugby League can never do it on their own, and that's what I'm going to bring. So if you go to Netflix, you got 122 countries yeah. viewing yeah, a former Super there. League yeah. Rugby League player now doing what I'm doing, but showcasing the greatest game of all in uh, in a in a you know in a graphic novel, comic book, film type of way. But the reason why I contact all these players to be involved because it makes it relevant. Yeah, so yeah. the kids are open to the comic, they're seeing the favourite players, they're seeing Conrad Holden, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. seeing Caelan Ponga there, they're seeing Gordon Tallis and Ruben Wick and Scott yeah. Thorpe and that. You know, I've not only just got the, the, uh, the, the relevant players now, but I've got some of the old timers in there as well. Where can we get the, the jerseys as well? So, so the jerseys, uh, it will be, I'll send you the videos through so you can... Yeah, we'll yeah. 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 Uh, but we're looking at, obviously we did the O'Neill's launch with the players the other week and, and, and he said to the players, you know, you've got a bit of acting today and uh, <laughs> you're going to say a couple of lines on that and now uh, Jermaine McGilvery's like, you're kidding me, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, it's just two lines, you'll be fine. Uh, but it's just brilliant to come back to the game and put the kit on. I mean, my son was there, my son was like, star around, I can't believe that. Yeah. But we were all having a laugh and it yeah, was good yeah. to come back into the game and, 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 and create something like this. Uh, you know, at first people might be looking and going, oh, what's going on here, what's all this about? But uh, no one ever expected the front row forward to, to, to be movies and write comic books. Yeah. But you know, like I said, I, I go against the grain. And, and, but it has been a lot of hard work. You know, I do get up every morning at 5 a.m. and I run and I, and I go to the gym. And then all my day is, is blocked out with what I need to do. Yeah. And also, you know, regarding mental health and that, yeah, I was in a bad place, but what I am right now is that it shows people that anything is possible if you just make the right steps. Because all of us have to take care of his mental health. Yeah. Whether it's getting up in the morning, I get up in the morning, I go outside, I get the sun on my face, I do a bit of grounding, so I take my shoes off and I'm walking on, 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 on the soil. And there's, there's health benefits for that. And then I land from a tree for 90 seconds. Don't ask me why, but it's great for your joints and you're right. locking out your muscles and stuff. And then I go work out and, you know, and everything I'm doing, I'm helping my mental health. Yeah. 
Whereas people talk about mental health, but if you're going working nine to five and then you're going out on the weekend, drinking on the weekend, feeling like yeah. not very good on the Sunday, yeah, yeah. and then doing the same cycle again. Yeah. And, then people, and then people wonder why they're not yeah, feeling right. good upstairs. And yeah. for me, it's like, I want to I want to set my own trail and go down my own, go down my own path and, and, and that's what I'm doing. And I think my motivation for me yeah, it's to inspire children, but my family's been the biggest motivation, you know, my children and, and my partner, because of what I've done, is what's most important to me is being a provider and taking care of my children and my partner and making my friends and family proud. Well, we'll look forward to monitoring rugby blood as the year go forward. Before you go, Keith, we'll have to do Drew's quick fire quick fire questions. I'm not sure. I haven't seen these, so... <laughs> uh, <laughs> cool. First of all, first rugby memory. Uh, my first rugby memory, my mum took me to Jules Moor. I might be in St John Fisher's, I was six years old, and I was a handful, and she needed to get me into rugby. <laughs> uh, best advice you received in your career? Best advice? Uh, I wouldn't say, I mean, I've had a lot of advice, and uh, I just remember talking to Tawara Mikau before I went to Melbourne, and he said they absolutely love being fit. And uh, he tell me, you've got to give it your all. And I think in life, it should never be a lack of effort that you don't succeed. And I think what he told me is that when you go into something, you go all in and you give it your absolute best. Good stuff. Uh, worst moments on a pitch? Worst moments? Oh, I've had quite a number of injuries. Uh, Monty B from, I think it was Rubber Wicky, I don't know, we spoke about it the other day on Instagram. Uh, I played for Wales and uh, against New Zealand, and he whacked me around the chin. He, as you can see, oh yeah, he yeah. was he was a big, he was a big old. I think that one, and I played my second game up in Brisbane North in uh, pre-season friendly, and I went to a floor to Cameron Smith, and I went back, and my f shoe ended up being on my shoulder, and I was out for nine weeks. I did it was my first major injury, and I was out and. And that was the worst moment wow. on a rugby league field. Uh, your idol growing up? Ellery Anley and uh, Marmaninga. <laughs> Team you supported growing up? You know what, I, I shouldn't have saying this, but I used to love watching Wigan. Uh -huh. uh, well, Wigan was like in the 80s and early 90s. You were a glory hunter then, Keith, is that what you said? No, <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed watching quality rugby players, you know. Ellery Anley and, and all them type of guys. Uh, it kind of inspired me to, to want to be a, a rugby player. So, uh, that's got to say. Proudest moments? My proudest moments is making my debut for Wakefield. Uh, I was 17. And obviously, I proved Dean Bell wrong. Uh, <laughs> obviously, you know, all the big games, uh, making my de debut for Melbourne against New Zealand Warriors was a big one. Uh, winning the Challenge Cup uh, was a big one and playing for my country. Uh, best player you've played with? Oh, I can't really say one player. Players I really enjoyed playing with was uh, Cunningham, Scullthorpe, uh, Brett Alton was quality, uh, Cameron, Billy. Uh, well, it's not a bad find, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I played with some absolute, some brilliant players. Uh, it's really hard because you know I, I played at Melbourne and Saints Ooh. at that time. You know, we're just littered with 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 players. But Kieran was a great leader. Uh, you know, he was a players player. Mm. Toughest opponent? Uh, Rob Barrow. Really? Yes. You know, you talk about all these big guys like Marley and all that. I used to love playing against them. Them to me wasn't tough because they're big guys and I'm yeah. thinking great. You're expecting that. Yeah, yeah great. It, it brought the best out of me. But you know, for you to step on that field as a rugby league player, every rugby league player is tough. Mm. You can't, I can't just pinpoint one out, but I used to enjoy playing against the likes of uh, Morleys and Peacocks and all these big players and Craig Smith and that. It brought the best out of me because that's what type of player I was. I was competitive and I was, you call it an enforcer, whatever you want to call it. But I think the smaller guys, uh, Luke Robinson, tremendously tough. You've got to think about it, man. They're five foot five and, and they're putting their body on the line week yeah. in, week out. Uh, and Gordon Tallis was was a, a player who I admired. 
probably above all them, them type of players. Uh, the best coach you've worked under? Uh, then I've had some great ones. Craig Bellingham was brilliant. Uh, Ian Millward, I enjoyed my time with Ian. It was, it was more fun at Saints because we had so, so much uh, talent. And Nathan Brown was great for me. And Nathan Brown came in and he just brought the best out of me. He gave me the coaches player of the year in 2009 when Brett Hodgson won the, won the steal. And I really enjoyed playing under him. It was a, it was a proper player's coach. Would you like to see the Biff brought back? Or would you leave it out? Biff, yeah, listen, uh, end of the day, the, you know, the game's so quick and I don't like the shitty bits in the game where people are just, you know, talking it up and stuff. The game's tough enough. Yeah. But uh, if two guys went into a collision and they both got up and they both started fighting, yes, him being a but don't, don't punish that guy because he's had a scrap or had a fight. Because at the end of the day, it's mano against mano, big man against a big man. Uh, and you should never take that physical aspect away from rugby league. It's a fine line between aggression and crossing that line. You know, and I think I played a bit like that. Great answer, Keith. Uh, <laughs> favourite ground to play on? Favourite ground? Uh, believe it or not, I used to like, I used to like playing at uh, <laughs> Wayfield. <laughs> 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 it's just good memories, you know, but we all meet Gaz Alice and, and Westwood and that came through there, and Danny Brough. Uh, Edinburgh was always a nice place, but I've got to say Nose of Road was my favourite. Mm. Uh, such a good atmosphere there, old school atmosphere. Uh, a quote that you live by? A quote is, uh, the quote, the slogan which, which is in uh, Rugby Blood, which is no sacrifice, no glory. There's no, yeah, no glory without it. sacrifice, so I've got it on here, yeah. yeah. So, it said there, yeah. so no, yeah, no sacrifice, no glory, meaning, you know, if you want to achieve something, you have to sacrifice. Uh, the good things in your life to have something great down the line and I think with that's the way I live my life you know uh, not cutting corners giving back and hopefully inspire kids to, to, to be great you know through a, through a story and uh, you know it's, it's exciting times for a bit blood uh, so tell us a tale from a mad one there <laughs> <laughs> oh wow be so many uh, man Monday were just like you know the players don't go out for ages and then all of a sudden you You've got a free reign <laughs> to do what you want and drink as much money, drink as much beer as you want, and then end up in some dump somewhere two days <laughs> later. Uh, there's been so many, but I mean, there's been one or two years where I did score a try, and there was quite a number of us, and you know we had to strip off completely naked, and then you know running through a town, <laughs> running past kids and that is not the best thing to do. You know, and you, you mix a piece of knocking. <laughs> You know, even back then now, if someone said that to me, I, I would never do it in a million years, but us rugby league players, we don't know anything different. And, and I think rugby league players, they are the salt of the earth, you know. So what were you doing that? Just running through like St. Helens Town Centre or something No, I was saying it was actually at Huddersfield, but yeah. they weren't just me, they were me, they were Hell Crabtree. Yeah. You know, there was quite a number of us, like big, small, little. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, there's some, there's some good memories, mate. I mean, end, end of the year, you know, it gets a bad rap, but... It's great for the players to to let a bit of steam. To, to celebrate and let a bit of steam, mate. Because you you don't know until you've been on that field and play at the high level for forty weeks. Uh, you need to have a have a release, and uh, you know, like I said, rugby league has, has given me everything, but I give rugby league everything as well. Mm -hmm. And to come back to to the game, and and to give back like this, you know, and to see kids dressing up on well book day mm -hmm. as David King, it, it, it is fun, you know. And super league obviously believe in what I'm doing, uh, and if we do the sport documentary. Uh, then again, it's going to put rugby league in a whole other, whole other showcase, and, and, and that's what we, that's what we need to do. We need to break new ground, uh, as new beginnings, as rugby league said, and that's what I'm going to bring. Brilliant, Keith. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks for coming in. If you need any rugby league journalists to uh, participate in any films, <laughs> we are available. Um, please do keep it all things love rugby league dot com for everything this week. All your news, match reports, stats, opinion. Uh, etc. Please do like and share on all the videos and leave your comments as well. We'll try and get back to you. Uh, we'll put some links into Rugby Blood as well for, for Keith. But that's it from us for this week. We'll see you next week.